are the Sierra Nevada mountains that ring this northern Nevada town of Reno. And Reno bills itself as the biggest little city in the world. By the way, it snowed a couple of hours ago, so those mountains are now capped with snow, but that won't affect us because we're indoors here at Valley's Resort and Casino. And as usual, the marquee out front proclaims why we are here. It's for the WBC World Welterweight title fight between Marlon Starling and Maurice Blocker. And we are now inside the ballroom at Valley's and glad you're with us. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dan Deerdorf, and this is the final show of our Schlitz Malt Liquor professional boxing season here for 1990. It's also the finale of our slate of shows for ABC Sports, uh, which we began back in January. We've got a couple of live fights for you here this afternoon, and also, if time allows, we're going to reprise the year and show you the highlights that we've seen along the way. Working with me again, as always, my partner, Alex Wallow. And Alex, uh, we're finishing our second year together. Uh, this is what, the end of your 40th year at ABC Sports, it seems like, with boxing. Uh, let's first turn our attention to the uh, main event. Uh, three times on the Schlitz Series, we've seen welterweight action. Uh, today, it's uh, Marlon Starling and Maurice Blocker. Uh, we have seen some good battles in the, in the welterweight division. Right, Dan. The key word here is welterweight, and that is a word that Marlon Starling absolutely hates to hear because he has been uh, fighting as a welterweight and battling to make the 147-pound limit for 16 years. It is very rare in boxing for a fighter to stay in one division half that long. Marlon hoped he would never have to hear the word welterweight again when he moved up two weight divisions to fight IBF middleweight champion Michael Nunn last April. But he lost a 12-round decision, and now he's back to reaffirm his claim to the unofficial title of best welterweight in the world. And that means diet and a lot of hard work for Marlon, which makes his trainer, Freddie Roach, very happy. Freddie says Marlon was much too fat and comfortable against Michael Nunn. Now he is lean and mean, and both trainer and fighty, fighters say, Dan, that a, a nasty Marlon Starling is bad news for Maurice Blocker. Well, you're right, and Marlon Starling, all along we've been saying he's the guy to beat in the welterweights. We'll see how he holds up this afternoon. First, the preliminary. We're going to do that in the junior middleweight division. Uh, uh, we were here in Reno last time to see Aaron Davis and Mark Breland. Can we expect anything like that today, Alex? Well, I really don't think so. It doesn't yeah. figure to be that kind of a fight, but that upset by Aaron Davis really did breathe new life into this welterweight division, Dan. Uh, and it makes this fight more significant for the welterweight picture. For one thing, there is now a champion in this division that Marlon Starling has not beaten. And Aaron Davis immediately in the ring afterwards uh, in an interview challenged Marlon Starling uh, to fight him. But the bigger picture is this. A lot of boxing people wonder about Marlon Starling, who will in fact be 32 years old in 10 days. They wonder if he still has what it takes to dominate this division. Is he beginning to fade? If Marlon gives one of his uninspired, just do enough efforts today, a lot of people may jump in the bandwagon of IBF champion Simon Brown, who's here at ringside today. As for Simon Brown's former stablemate and good friend, Maurice Blocker, the challenger today, he was untested and unprepared to win when he got his first shot at a title three years ago. He switched his team to promoter Butch Lewis, uh, manager Michael Spinks, the former light heavyweight and heavyweight champion, and 79-year-old trainer, very respected trainer, Eddie Futch. Maurice has been very carefully matched with seven safe opponents since the loss to Hunnigan in 1987, and will know very soon whether he is now prepared to make the big step up in class. The odds, Dan, are a surprisingly close two to one favoring the champion, Marlon Starling. Yeah, you're right, Alex. Maurice Blocker is already in the ring. We're awaiting the arrival of Marlon Starling. While we wait for Marlon here on our Schlitz Malt Liquor Professional Boxing Series, let's take this break. <laughs> Listen to my nephew, he's gonna be a I guess we should have expected a championship delay, making his opponent wait. 45, six and one with 27 of those 45 wins being knockouts. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape. And you see here, of course, the tremendous height advantage enjoyed by Maurice Blocker, over four inches taller than Marlon Starling. Marlon Starling, 31, he'll be 32 later this month. The WBC rules are in effect here today. Scoring is on the 10-point must system. The three knockdown rule is not in effect. The standing eight is not in effect either. A fighter cannot be saved by the bell, except in the final round, and only the referee can stop the fight. And the referee here today, a familiar face in Nevada fights, that is Mills Lane. And the three scoring judges, Miguel Donate, Chuck Giampa, and Lynn Carter. 
And here is our ring announcer. There's Michael Spink. Michael Spink is the manager of Maurice Blanca and certainly wins the award as the best dressed manager, at least here today. Dan, we constantly talk about how important it is for fighters to get off first, to initiate the action, to dictate the pace. Marlon Sterling, who you see being introduced there, is not that kind of a fighter. He is a counterpuncher. He likes to let you, uh, uh, let you punch first and then take advantage of the opening that your punch creates. The trainer for uh, Maurice Blocker is Eddie Futch, who once trained Marlon Sterling, knows go, him Jim, very, very yeah. well. Work, and he does not want, he says the way to beat a counterpuncher is to make him leave, to sit there and wait. So uh, the good news is we have perhaps the best welterweight in the world against a legitimate top five contender in the ring. But the bad news is because of those styles, this could be excruciating to watch. Somebody is going to have to take uh, the lead. Good work, guys. Thank you. Well, Maurice Blocker certainly came out of the blocks in a hurry. He was the first to the middle of the ring. But you're right, if both of these try to settle into a counter-puncher's role, if we employed the punch stat, I don't know that it would suffer a meltdown here this afternoon. With uh, two fighters with white trunks, we will say Maurice Blocker is the taller, and very quietly, so he can't hear us, the bolder of the two fighters. <laughs> Our graphic uh, told you that Marlon Starling has the purple trim around the top of his shorts, but you're right. Maurice Blocker almost, and I say almost, a Mark Breland type physique. Although Breland a couple inches even taller than even Blocker is. You see the Blocker block barely six feet. You see the Blocker jab. He's a stand-up boxer, does not have much power. Is a surprisingly good body puncher for a, for a, a man that tall. Good. I think you saw a combination that Marlon Starling will attempt to use periodically during this fight, a right to the ribs and then follow it right up with a right uppercut. The belief of Freddie Roach and the people in Marlon Starling's corner that the long, lean body of Maurice Blocker will not last for a full 12 round. We should set up, set up that storyline also. Uh, we said that Eddie Fudge in Blocker's corner formerly trained Starling. When Eddie and Starling had a, a Marlon had a falling out, Freddie Roach, who was a former fighter of Eddie Fudge's, who trained under Eddie Fudge for nine years, worked as a fighter, a featherweight uh, under Eddie Fudge for nine years, and then when he retired was made an assistant trainer by Eddie Fudge, chose not to go with Eddie when Eddie walked out of Marlon's camp and stay with him. He did the same thing when Eddie had a dispute with Virgil Hill. And that, of course, if you recognize Freddie Roach, is where you've seen him the most here on ABC in the corner of the light heavyweight champion, Virgil Hill. This is the first time the two men have trained against each other. Oh, good right counter punch that time by Marlon Stalling. Lands flush on Blocker's head. And Maurice Blocker letting his gloves come down a little bit, Alex. Yeah, and watch what he does when he jabs. He brings his left back very low. He just drops it completely when he jabs. And when you're in against a counterpuncher like Starling, that is a very bad tactic. A habit you'd be well advised to overcome. Still in the first round, this championship fight scheduled for a dozen. And already the gloves perilously low on Maurice Blocker. This is the end of the first. Well, this doesn't look very It's one eight zero zero eight four eight 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 eight. Gee, that's Super 8 Motel's 800 number. Oh. <laughs> super room, super price, super 8. Welcome back to Reno. Action here in the second round. And we have to say, Dan, already in the, the first round here at the start of the second, the pace has been much, much quicker than we expected. Marlon Sterling is fighting like a guy who knows he has to be impressive today to keep himself in line for one of those mega bucks fights. And Marlon Sterling will be the first to tell you that he's fighting for the money, that he's looking for that, as he calls it, that million-dollar payday, his last fight was his biggest payday against Michael Nunn, but he had to move up the middleweight to do it. He had to move all the way up to 160, and that was not a very glamorous fight.
There is Eddie Butts, one of the trainers of Maurice Flocker, and one of the grand gentlemen in the world of boxing. 79 years old. He's starting to put on a little weight right now, but he used to tell people the truth that he once sparred with Joe Lewis back in Detroit, but that time it was hard to believe. He is inching slowly towards heavyweight. Well, when you're 79, I guess you can do whatever you feel like. <laughs> The pace has picked up here in the second round. You see Marlon carrying his left pretty low. He may be trying to draw a right hand and then look to shoot a counter. See him leaning yeah. back there? Sometimes you try to give your opponent the impression there's an opening, let him lead, take the lead, and then take advantage of the opening that hits punch. Oh, and there's a mouthpiece of Marlon Stein. It was an uppercut by Maurice Walker. Uppercut, blew the mouthpiece right out of Marlon Starling's mouth. The rules say that in the in the action, the referee will step in and replace the mouthpiece, and that's what Mills Lane is doing right now. From Maurice Blocker's point of view, and the point of view, that was not a sufficient law. Maurice Blocker had his man in a little bit of trouble, right. and he should have been allowed to continue. Right, as long as the fighters are exchanging blows, the referee can't step in. He has to wait for a break in the action. Well, I think in Mills' defense, then, they, had, they had stopped punching, but they were not close. I think by the definition of the WBC, there was a low in the action. So there was no low in that uppercut. That was respect time. Yeah. Maurice Blocker is not known as a puncher. He has knocked out on his record, but he has not shown real power in the past. He has shown a good chin. He does take a good punch. He has never been down, and I've never seen him hurt, Dan. He should repeat, the only quality opponent up until now was that title fight with Lloyd Hunter. You don't get overly excited about. Well, the end of the second round, and things have picked up nicely. Well, here's Blocker's best punch of the fight. Watch the left uppercut right on the chin, and there goes Marlon Starling's mouthpiece. The bell sounds, and we're underway here in the third. And Mills Lane is about to get angry. He is, and Mills Lane does not like to lose control of a fight. Alex, you call that right, and Mills Lane's going to call them together. When he finishes with this one, he can go over the Middle East because I don't think he's going to turn these guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bill Slane does not have a great sense of humor in the ring. Oh, a good left hand there by Blocker. Marlon Sterling has a reputation as the best defensive fighter in boxing. He is trying to be more aggressive here, and he's getting hit with many more punches than he's used to. Whether that's a function of a change of style or a function of his deterioration, I don't know. You're right, Alex. It's not the Marlon Starling that a lot of fighters and fight fans have grown accustomed to seeing. And, you know, you mentioned earlier about him looking for the big payday. Uh, uh, could this be a conscious effort to change his style to make it more entertaining? Well, I think it is. Uh, and I think right now he may decide that uh, he should go back to what he used to say his old strategy was. I'm not here to please fans. I'm here to win fights. Better be ugly and win than entertaining and lose. But from his point of view, uh, he'd still like to do both, and I don't think yeah. he's yet in the position, even though Blanco has gotten off uh, even in rounds on my scorecard and scoring well here in the third. I still don't think uh, you know, Marlon's being blown out by any means. I know that Maurice Blocker has a great chin, but it's going to be tested if he keeps throwing that left from down around his waist. There's a, a fighter IBF welterweight champion, Simon Brown, who are dearly loved to test, he says. <laughs> Marlon Sterling's chin. We said at the top, Simon is a very good friend of Maurice Blocker. They are both from Washington, D.C. Well, oh, Simon originally from Jamaica, but now lives uh, outside Washington. And they were stable mates for a long time. And Simon uh, put Maurice uh, to win this fight, but that may be more friendship than uh, analysis. Right now, it doesn't look like that bad a pick. Oh, and there's a good right hand backing out a little bit by Marlon Sterling. One of the point here, Dan. This is a much faster pace than either man is used to. And when they're fighting above what they're used to, stamina, conditioning, 
and hard will have a lot to do with who wins the fight. Right now, Blocker seems to be breathing a little bit heavier. See more of his mouth too. This is action at the end of the third. Remember, we're here for 12. Come on along, I'll take this. Here we go in the fourth, and Alex, sometimes the reason people disagree with the three scoring judges is the way you and I sat there for a minute and said, my gosh, how did we score the third round? Real close. Well, boy, Mar Maurice Blocker is moving Marlon Sterling with his punches, and he is not, does not have the reputation as a big puncher. We talked about stamina at the end of the last round, Dan. One other point, Reno altitude, 4,500 feet. I mean, it's not Denver where you're going for tomorrow night's Monday night football game, but it still is altitude, and a lot of fighters have been fooled and tired by it. Wild exchanges by both fighters. A much faster pace than we expected. Low blow there by Blanca. Yep. And there's the warning from Mills Lane. Please get it up. Oh, and there's Blocker just grabbing Starling by the back of the head and pulling him forward. Believe it or not, Maurice Blocker, for a man that tall, actually got penalized a point in his title fight with Lloyd Huntington for low blows. Blocker quick to say that the reason he lost that fight was he took it on very short notice. Yeah, he should blame his good friend Simon Brown. Yeah, that's Simon, exactly right. Simon Brown was scheduled to go over to England to face Lloyd Huntington at a hand entry. Ten days before the fight, Maurice Blocker took it on very, very short notice. A reminder to our local ABC stations that at the end of this round, we'll be taking a station break. This round is the fourth. Dan Deardorff and Alex Swallow with you ringside from Valley's Hotel and Casino here in Reno, Nevada. The WBC welterweight championship of Marlon Starling is at stake. Maurice Blocker just worn by referee Lane uh, not to push off with his slug. They're flipping the jab, and, and that's a lazy jab, and it comes back pretty low, and I'm really surprised Marlon has not been able to counter it. It's a lazy jab, Alex, and it's also, again, coming low. It's not really, it's coming from down there by the hip. The other thing you would expect is that so much of this fight has been fought on the inside. You would expect Marlon Starling to absolutely Ooh. eat Maurice Blocker up on the inside. That has not been the case. And when you listen to Starling's camp before the fight, that was their number one game plan. Work the body. Work that long lean frame and another solid, solid right counter punch by Starling. Right to the ribs. And again, Blanca breathing heavily. Well, if he absorbs a whole lot of body punches like that, you're darn right he's going to breathe heavily. Now, Marlon Starling... Slitzball Liquor Professional Boxing featuring the WBC World Welterweight Championship will continue after this... You can buy this house in West County, or you can cross the... Can't be a You're invited to take the challenge September 17th. Action in round number five. Marlon Starling with the purple trim at the top of his white shorts. Maurice Blocker wearing the all-white. Blocker the taller of the two, and as my colleague Alex Swallow told you, for identification purposes, the balding gentleman. Oh, and another right-hand counterpunch by Marlon Starling, who has really been hurting Blocker with that right hand in the counter to the body. I started to say at the end of the fourth round, the last round, that I really thought that might have been a turning point. Marlon really started to take over at the end of that round. Oh, and you saw that right hand again snap the head of Blocker. And I think you might have seen just a trace of a smile from Mucci, Marlon Starling. A little bit of desperation right now, Blocker. He needs a second win. And the body punches from Marlon Starling are not helping him. And that was... All Eddie Futch, not Eddie Futch, that's all the Freddie Roach talked about. And Marlon Starling's corner that last break was 
Work the body, work the body. You're starting to break this guy up inside. Keep it up. And he said something else that, that is very rarely heard in the corner. He said, you're using the jab too much. Very few trainers will tell their man to stop jabbing. He wants Marlon inside with power punches. As you said, trying to break him up and trying to rough him up. There's Maurice Blocker's father, Sloan Blocker. What an agonizing position to be in to sit there defenselessly and watch your son take some of the shots that Maurice Blocker's taking here from Marlon Starling. And Maurice Hill, an, an excellent fight to this point, Alex. But his dad was not uh, cheering at all, but Maurice is doing a lot of talking in there. I don't know whether he's talking to himself, trying to rub himself up, or talking to Marlon, but... You see Blocker mouthing words, and not uncommon for a fighter to talk to himself or an athlete really in any sport. Very seldom, though, do you talk to yourself and say, great job. <laughs> you normally talk to yourself because you're upset. He's trying to find the rhythm. <laughs> you can hear the groan go from the audience at that right hand from Starling and Miss. Steve Marlin with the left arm right down. He's trying to throw a right hand. I don't know whether he's looking to hook or bringing his own right hand back. The closing seconds of round number five. Gravity. Both fighters move to the middle of the ring for the sixth round of this 12-round championship fight here on our Slit Small Liquor professional boxing series on ABC. I'm Dan Deardorff along with Alex Wallow. We're at Valley's Hotel here in Reno. The reason these guys are here is a shot at Marlon Starling's belt, the man on the left, the WBC welterweight champion. Alex Wallow, your assessment of what's happened so far? Well, it has not been with a capital letters an excruciating fight to watch thus far. It, it's been a much better action fight than we expected because both men have gone out there and, and, and been aggressive and going after what they both need. Uh, Maurice Block on the left wants the world championship. Marlon Starling not only wants to keep his title, but he wants to put himself in a position for uh, big money fights down the road against an Aaron Davis or a Julio Cesar Chavez or a Melvin Taylor. You see a lot of grease on the eyelids and the upper eyes of Marlon Starling. They've also used end swell on his left eye, puffiness uh, predominantly on his left eye. Well, Maurice Blocker certainly doesn't have to look far for a little inspiration. How about to his manager, Michael Spinks, the former light heavyweight and heavyweight champion of the world. Michael Spinks, the manager of Maurice Blocker. And no passive observer there, Michael Spinks. No, that's, that's an isolated, you might remember, when Michael used to cheer for Leon. Michael used to die a thousand deaths when Leon was in the ring. He says, we talked to Michael, he says he is comfortable in his retirement, but there's a little something in his voice that gives you the impression that he is not 100% committed to it yet. You know, you mentioned Leon Spinks. I'll take this opportunity to pass along our condolences. Leon Spinks' son was murdered several weeks ago in St. Louis, and our condolences to Leon Spinks and to Michael Spinks. But business is ha at hand is Maurice Blocker and Marlon Starling. And it has certainly not been the type of fight that both of these fighters said ahead of time that they would fight. I'm glad they lied. No. <laughs> I'm glad they did too. just wrapping up Starling. If we end up going the distance, when you hear the bell, we'll be halfway there. Referee Mills Lane says, let's get going here in the seventh round. Halfway, I got Starling up by a point. Maurice 
Walker, the younger of the two fighters, 27 years of age. Marlon Starling is 31, will be 32 later on this month of August. There's Walker doing a little work inside out. Yeah, I want to make this point at the top of the fight, but it really wasn't the, the fight didn't lend itself to it. But generally, Marlon Starling's fights are very difficult to score because Marlon is such a clever defensive fighter, so subtle. He picks up so many punches with his gloves. Doesn't slip as many as you might think, but blocks an awful lot. And, and, and for that reason, you have to... Oh, and there's a right-hand counter by Starling right on Blocker's chin. I was going to say, for that reason, you have to concentrate very, very hard in scoring a Marlon Starling fight to see what of the opponent's punches get home. Well, Alex, you mentioned the quality of the chin of Maurice Blocker. That was a big-time shot that he took right there on the chin. It really never even buckled his leg. It was funny, Dan, the, the, the cliche in boxing is big punches don't have good chins. Here's a case where a guy who's not known as a big puncher has a real good chin. We should also point out that with the exception of the first Mark Breland fight, Marlon Starling is not a huge one-punch knockout guy. Well, and that knockout came in, what, the 11th round, and at that point in time, Breland was having trouble standing up. that left. When Marlon Sterling puts that left to the side, the way he's cocking his body, it looks like he's, he wants to rip a, a right hand. Well, I would think that Blocker is giving him an opportunity with that left hand down low, Alex. Of course, Just Marlon Sterling has a long way to reach to land it on the chin. Except that Maurice has not been fighting as much of this fight at distance as I thought he would. Good flurry inside by Blocker. Boy, Maurice is just dying to get air. Well, he'll get his chance here in just a couple of seconds. We come to the end of the seventh. And as you can see, Marlon is not fresh as a daisy either. Oh, and he's cut. Here comes Eddie Aliano, cut over the left eye. I really didn't see where it happened. It had to happen at the end of the round. Alex, let's take a look, see if we can find the cut. I really can't tell, Dan, if it's happened yet. There's the right hand. That was not the, the closing hand. It was the right hand right. early in the round that Starling landed. It, it's not a huge cut over the left eye. And but it's, it's in a bad place. Yeah. I'm not sure that we'd have the capabilities to try to find that with any degree of accuracy to tell you that that's the blow that caused the cut. Regardless, here we go in the eighth round. And we'll monitor that cut over the left eye of Marlon Starling. Both fighters it is, we should, wearing white trunks. Look for the purple trim on the shorter Marlon Starling. Yeah, the purple trim with some red around it. Uh, about to be a lot of red because that, is a, that has to be a bad cut. If Eddie Eliano lets a man come out of the corner with blood coming out, uh, it's, he's got a problem. It's on the eyelid, there's swelling. And Eddie Eliano is a A1 cut man. He could not stop that cut with the time he had He had to work on it. And he's getting prepared for the next round. He's putting his dog pad there. He's getting his adrenaline uh, solution. Well, if any fighter I know, Alex, had to go into a defensive posture to protect a bad eye, Marlon Starling would be one of my choices. And he's not doing it. I mean, he's not putting his hands up in his the peekaboo defensive posture that he normally does. He's carrying his hands much lower. Well, maybe that's an indication that the cut isn't bothering Marlon Starling. Well, it may be. 
It may also be that he's just not adjusting well to it. It may also be that his arms are tired. A lot of pushing and shoving in there now. Mills Lane steps in and separates the two. A little over halfway through the eighth round. Oh, and there's a good flurry and combination by Maurice Blocker. And there's Marlon Starling covering up. And Maurice Blocker must have thrown ten punches and hit nothing but forearms and gloves. You see the Maurice Blocker trunks are quickly becoming pink. Uh, that is not his own blood. with a pair of nicknames, Moochie or the Magic Man. That's the nickname that's embroidered on his shorts. Let's give credit to these two fighters, Dan. Oh, this... We bad about this fight at the, at the top, and, and it, they're both dead tired right now, and they're just fighting their hearts out. Eddie Aliano will be busy again on the left eye of Marlon Starling in the break here between the eighth and the ninth. We tested STP. Eddie Aliano has left a great deal of white substance over the left eye of Marlon Starling, and I think Maurice Blocker was kind enough to go ahead and remove it already. I don't know if that was cotton or... No, that, that's not cotton. That's all this tape coming off Blocker's glove. Hey, I got tape box. Come here, come here. Yeah, here's here's hey, a funny hey, thing. Hey, hey, Marlon. Sorry. I talked hey, to Eddie Fudge when we interviewed him before the fight about why so many fighters are having tape problems. I mean, we've looked at a lot of old fight films. I can never remember an old fight film tape coming off a fighter's gloves. And I said to Eddie, is this a function of a bad tape or there's a, a cut? Oh, you can see the problem. Come on, here we go. Good look at the cut right in the eyebrow of Marlon Starling. Go ahead, finish your tape. I'm sorry. Sarah. Well, anyway, Eddie said, I've never had a fighter of mine have a problem with tape in his gloves. And here Maurice Blocker's tape is coming off. I, I really don't understand it. Oh, and it's Marlon Starling picking up the pace. The more we got a good look at that cut. To this point in time, it's been effectively controlled by Starling's corner. Well, it doesn't seem to be swelling up. It doesn't appear to be on the verge of, uh, of obstructing any of his vision. Well, he's a fighter who, who generally puffs up, especially against long-arm fighters like Maurice Blocker or Mark Green. He's been very puffy. He has been cut, I believe, in his right eye before. I don't remember being cut in his left. If you can cut, though, without that balloon-like swelling right. that we've seen, what, Aaron Davis had it, uh, Paul Hodkinson fights we've seen earlier this year. If you can cut without swelling, it'll be a plus. Let me tell you one thing, Eddie Eliano, as we've pointed out here and many other times and other people have too, it's no secret, he's a great cut man. Marlon Starling has to help him. I mean, the best cut man in the world can't help you if you let your man hit you right on the cut with the first point of this round, you put your head in there at close quarters, and you don't hold your hand up. hands up. I mean, if anybody could, there, there you see Marlon protecting it, but if anybody, you, you would think, could consistently protect the cut, it would be Marlon Starling, and yet he is not. Very right good now, Bill's Lane wants the doctor to look at this cut again. Bill's Lane stopping it here on the ninth for the ring doctor in attendance to look at the cut. We've got okay, 35 we go. seconds Tap, left here on the ninth. But Alex, you made an excellent point. Ooh. Oh, and another good right hand counter over that lazy left of blockers this time. Charlie's punch landed on the head. 
Marlon is fighting now with desperation of a man who thinks this fight may be stopped by that cut. Well, the cut is bleeding. We will check between rounds yeah. again to find out. I'm sure it's not, but just to make sure that that the referee Mills Lane did not rule that that cut was caused by a bump. Again, a reminder that we're going to stay and we'll go to Marlon Starling's corner. There's the bell ending the night. Go to him with the jab and fire it up. Go to him, he's running from you, okay? Now let's go to him with the jab and throw combinations, you hear me? Yep. Go to him with the jab, you'll beat this guy. Keep him backing up the whole round, you hear me? You need these three rounds to win the fight, okay? The fight's dead even, you gotta pick it up. You're the champion, let's go to work. Let's go to work, you hear me? Champion, go to him with the jab and fire the right hand. Quick, hard combinations. You're the best, now let's show it, okay? All right, this guy's dead time. Now you stay on this son of a bitch, you hear me? You're gonna have to fight. Come on, Jim. Jim. You might have seen on one of those angles, Dan, the doctor, the gentleman in the gray suit, looking down in the eye, not interfering with Eddie Eliano's ability to do his job, but looking at it. The bell sounds for the beginning of the 10th. You heard Freddie Roach telling Marlon Starling, you've got to win all three to win the fight. Consistently calling in champion. There's a warning to Parker on grabbing behind the head. We just confirmed with the uh, WBC supervisor that, in fact, that uh, referee Mills Lane did not notify them that that cut was caused by a butt in round seven. So he is assuming that it was a punch. And therefore, uh, if this fight is stopped by that cut, Maurice Blocker is the winner. There's no technical decision, no going to score cards, nothing. Marlon Starling chasing Maurice Blocker, but not landing any meaningful blows. Aggression, but as the phrase goes, not really meaningful aggression. He's landing his chair. Right. I'm just amazed that both men have been able to keep up this work rate. My definition of a meaningful blow is a blow that causes some damage. It exacts some sort of a toll from the other fighter. We are in the 10th round. Dan Yerdorf, Alex Wallow here ringside on our Slip Small Liquor Professional Boxing Series here on ABC. And you're looking at what many people in boxing consider a miracle. <laughs> this fight was expected to be a dog. Not only has it been entertaining in terms of action, it's close on our scorecards. It may well hang in the balance. There was good work by Starling of covering up and attempting to protect that left eye. champion. He beat Mark Freeland to win the WBA version. He then beat Lloyd Huntigan to win the WBC title that he now has. Marlon jumped on Maurice there like he thought he might have hurt him. I think it was just a matter of a little bit of fatigue in Maurice and he stumbled a little bit. You don't see the flow of blood flowing quite as hard now as it did in the ninth round, but a little more swelling, Alex. The eyelid of the left eye of Marlon Starling Impossible to tell how much that blood is obscuring his vision, how much the swelling is obscuring his vision. Oh, you got to be inside there to know for sure. Here we come to the end of the tenth round in about that is scheduled to go twelve. And look at the blood pour out of that cut over the left eye of Marlon Starling. Let me tell you something. Eddie Aliano put everything in there but uh, axle grease, and he just couldn't do anything no. even temporarily to stem the flow of blood. No, Marlon Starling now has to fight, one, to protect himself, but two, he's got to be concerned about a ring doctor stepping in and stopping this fight. We're in the 11th. And right now, the cut is bleeding more profusely than it has bled this entire fight. And Maurice Walker didn't help it any there with that right hand. There's Marlon Starling attempting to keep that left up over the eye, and that would be a smart move. 
concentrating so much on the drama of the cut down, you've got to really count punches. Who's winning these rounds? Well, I think Blocker's more active. Marlon scored some heavy punches the last round. Tough fight to score. Right now, Marlon Stalin has got to worry about getting to a decision, Alex. But he's also got to be worried if he gets yep. to it, he's yep. on the right side of it. Yep. He's got to, he's in got a real dilemma. I mean, he can't protect it so much he's not scoring punches. He can't give rounds away. His trainer has told him that the fight was even going into the 10th round. Oh, good left hand. The, the, the fight, the, the cut is bleeding, and it is bleeding a lot. But again, the left eye of Marlon Starling is wide open. Now the blood has to be running into his eye, but at least the eye isn't swelling shut. You saw a lot of mouthpiece there from Maurice, and you saw him force a clinch. And he's backpedaling. Everybody in the Starling corner is waving at him, come forward, come forward. Well, Marlon Starling. And he's doing his best. There's just a little over four minutes left in this fight. There's Freddie Roach, the trainer of Marlon Starling. A minute left here in the 11th, and then the three minutes of the 12th. You saw the and look of a little bit of, a lot of concern and a little bit of disgust from Freddie because he thought that Marlon had a chance to go forward right there, and he stayed at distance. He wants Maurice Blocker backing out on his back foot. He wants Mucci pressing the action. Lynch, Marlon was smart enough to put his head on the other side to protect his left eye. We're going to stay here between the 11th and the 12th. And again, we'll follow Marlon Starling into his corner to see what Eddie Aliano can do with that cut. When he knock out to win this guy. You've got to let the punches go. You hear me? Now go get him. Jim, you've got to let all big shots go to his head. Let's go. you got to let that right hand go. Let it go. You need, you need to get this guy in the deck to win this fight. Don't forget, so tomorrow fight, night I'll catch up with Alan Frank and Mile yeah, High Stadium minutes. in Denver. This is no summer rerun here. This is the 49ers and the Broncos, a rematch of Super Bowl 24, 8 o'clock Eastern tomorrow night, 5 o'clock Pacific, right here on ABC. Okay, give it up. That's it. All right. This is Alan. Don't you get careless in there. That's the corner of Maurice Blocker. Don't you get careless. see that blood and the fighters come out touch gloves and the crowd appreciates what they've seen through 11 this the 12th and final round and a more contrast in the corners dan freddie roach told marlon strong he needed a knockout to win in the block of corner they just said don't get careless that must be who oh and a good right hand by starling again catches blocker flush talked early about the chin of Maurice Blocker. He certainly has had ample opportunity to display it here today. He's taken some good shots, and he has not wavered. Needless to say, the two fighters, Marlon Starling, showing much more wear and tear. Marlon is not right now fighting like a man who thinks he needs a knockout to win. He may be trying to draw Maurice up to the right hand, but he just isn't putting it together at this point. Whether Freddie's right or not, I don't know. Freddie may just be trying to inspire a big effort. We've said many times, Dan, don't accept the word of the corner man trying to motivate his fighter is what they think in reality. Halfway through the final round, of our final fight here in our 1990 Slitzball Liquor Boxing Series. The 
it's also the end of our ABC series that we started back in January, and it has been fun. And this has been an excellent effort by both these fighters. You see Cedric Kushner there, the man, uh, well, I won't say that some people call him a walrus, but uh, the man there with the mustache at ringside in the blue suit waving Marlon Sterling in. scores at 115-113, winner by majority decision, and new WBC Welterweight Champion of World Maurice Blocker, Blocker! Dan, I'm looking at the scorecards now, one judge gave Blocker the last round, he needed it to win, and gave him 115-113, 